For more than 35 years, the Woodrow Wilson Visiting Fellows Program has brought prominent artists, diplomats, journalists, business leaders, and other non-academic professionals to campuses across the United States for substantive dialogue with students and faculty members. Through a week-long residential program of classes, seminars, workshops, lectures, and informal discussions, the fellows create better understanding and new connections between the academic and non-academic worlds. Instead of the one-day visit that's typical of the typical uh, college lecture circuit, the Visiting Fellows Program provides time for complex issues to be explored and ongoing relations to be established. Through these week-long visits, students and faculty members can explore how the classroom and campus relate to the broader society. And by their own example, the fellows demonstrate that there are challenging opportunities for those who want to build a better world through professional activities and as informed citizens. The Woodrow Wilson Visiting Fellows Program is administered by the Council of Independent Colleges and we appreciate its role in making it possible for Stephen F. Austin State University to participate in the program. Our interviewer for this evening is someone who needs really no introduction to most of us in the audience today. As someone who served as mayor of the city of Nacogdoches for eight years, as a Nacogdoches city commissioner for 10 years, Judy McDonald is well known to most of us. Please join me now in welcoming a true Nacogdoches treasure, Judy McDonald. Thank you, Rick. Appreciate it. Good job. Thank you. She has served in the U.S. Department of Justice as a Deputy Atto Assistant Attorney General and on the State Board of Education. In 2010, she became the chair of American Bridge, a nonprofit organization that raises funds for Democratic candidates and causes. She serves on the board of directors of the John F. Kennedy Library Foundation and on the board of Points of Light, a national nonpartisan organization dedicated to engaging citizens in solving serious social problems through voluntary service. Townsend is the author of Failing America's Faithful, How Today's Churches Are Mixing God with Politics and Losing Their Way. Please join me in welcoming to Stephen F. Austin State University and to our stage this evening, our Woodrow Wilson Visiting Fellow, Kathleen Kennedy Townsend. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Kathleen. So glad you're here. Thank you. <laughs> this is great. You all may be able to tell we've spent a lot of time together the last couple of days. I wish that we have. Great time. Uh, and I, again, I'm going to thank the audience for coming to listen to us talk because this is strictly a conversation with somebody that I think you're really and truly going to enjoy getting to know. Uh, I also want to thank Kathleen for coming. <laughs> and I also want to thank the Woodrow Wilson, just as Dr. Berry has mentioned, the Woodrow Wilson uh, Visiting Fellow. That just made it work for us, and we're very grateful. Also, the committee that has worked over the last several months, and you know who you are, and I'm not going to call everybody's name, but they did a fantastic job of scheduling Kathleen to go through all of these different classes and get to meet a lot of our people, a lot of our students. But we would not be here tonight. None of this would have happened if it were not for Dr. Janice Patillo. That is so true. Janice has worked since 2010 to make this event happen. And I'm going to ask you if you will join me in thanking her for that. <laughs> now, to start this off with a rousing uh, new element added just Sunday evening and Monday morning, can we have the first slide? Does anybody recognize those people? <laughs> Kathleen, tell us the story. Well, <laughs> the story is that I was coming, uh, I flew to Houston, 
And um, I was picked up very nicely by Janice and, and Beth, and, and I was very excited about coming here to SFA. And we didn't look very closely at our luggage, and the next day I woke up and I looked at my luggage and realized somebody had taken my bag. Who could that be? Turns out it was Lyle Lovett. <laughs> so he called me up and said, you have my bag. I said, I know, and I have yours. He said, where are you? Nagadoches. Nagadoches. I love Nagadoches. <laughs> it is the great city. It is an historic city. What are you doing there? He said, I'm at SFA. Oh, that is a fabulous university. So you have Lyle Lovett loving you. <laughs> and then um, I called Janice and I said, we have to UPS Lyle Lovett's baggage to him. And Janice said, oh, we have great police here at SFA. They will go and see him. And one of them was named Kennedy. I'm happy to claim her as my cousin, if she'll have me. <laughs> anyway, they drove to, um, to his home and can we read what, what he said? They, they had, it's not only. You can't have it. Anyway, he texted me this very funny story about they shared a, a you know, banana cream pie at the local banana cream, munchies or something. And uh, they, he had his own sheriff from his county meet the police from SFA. <laughs> so it would be official that the bags would be exchanged. And thanks to that, I now have my brush and can brush my hair. Thank you very much. <laughs> that story was too good to pass up. So now we'll get to the business of the night. <laughs> Kathleen, uh, our first question, we've been through a lot of this today, but tell us what it was like growing up on Hickory Hill, the oldest child of Robert and Ethel Kennedy, the oldest grandchild of Joe and Rose Kennedy, and born on the 4th of July. Yes. Yeah, my mother has a great sense of timing. And actually, my brother uh, Christopher um, was also born on the 4th of July, which I'll just tell you about. He, uh, my mother played on six sets of tennis, which is a lot when you're nine months pregnant. <laughs> And then um, my, uh, at that point, my uncle was president of the United States, my father the attorney general, um, my other uncle was the, uh, a senator um, from Massachusetts, Senator Ted Kennedy, and then my um, other uncle was the start of the Peace Corps, Sarge Shriver, and they used to come by helicopter to Hyannisport to um, drop them off over the weekend. And my mother, having played six sets of tennis, did feel like she wasn't going labor pains, jumped on the helicopter, went to Boston, and had my younger brother 12 years on my 12th birthday. <laughs> on your 12th birthday. So she was very good. Um, that is a great example. I mean, I grew up in a wonderful time in a, an amazing family. Um, being the oldest of 11 children is terrific. I, I met a young woman today who grew up with 12 kids in her family, so um, I was very impressed by her. But there are a number of different parts of our family. One, having a lot of kids creates chaos, um, as well as having you know, dogs and horses and pigs and sheep. And Don't forget to see Ella, And um, what else did we have? Oh, the seal. my brother had, oh, we had a, oh, I'll tell you about the seal, but we also, my brother c collected um, snakes and cotamundis and pigeons and hawks and falcons. Um, and my uncle once gave me a seal for Christmas. <laughs> and I was trying to teach the seal how to jump through a, I don't know if you younger people have ever heard of a hula hoop. <laughs> so I was trying to teach him how to jump through the hula hoop into the pool. He didn't, I didn't teach him very well. He, his tail hit the hula hoop and I went into the pool. Since it was February, it was rather cold, and that was the end of the seal. Sandy the seal then went to the ba uh, Washington Zoo. Uh, but you get a sense of there, there was a lot going on, um, which was always really interesting. One of the great stories about my mother, she, uh, she, uh, she had a rebellious side to her, if anybody saw that film about her. And so when we used to ride, and we'd ride near the CIA, and one day she said, 
heard some horses neighing, and she, thought, she said, i got to stop. What are they doing? And she saw these about four horses, and they were very thin. And so my mother said, well, this is outrageous. Uh, we'll get the groom. We had a groom. Pick them up, brought them to our house. And then, of course, we lived in Virginia, and the um, uh, person who owned the horses didn't like my mother's actions and sued her. And, you know, in Virginia, horse theft at that time was a hanging offense. <laughs> And my father was the attorney general, <laughs> which meant he was in charge of making sure people obeyed the law, which was really difficult being married to my mother. <laughs> and so he got his best attorney to defend her. And you know, here I was in third grade, eight years old. Do you follow the father who obeys the law or the mother who doesn't? Anyway, my mother was left, uh, was eventually um, uh, declared not guilty, so she, she was very lucky, no hanging that, that year. <laughs> um, but it really, it was, it, it, the, the other great story about my mother, uh, <laughs> there are many great stories. I will, don't just talk about mother, I'll be a little serious, but my father didn't really get along with the person who at that point was the head of the FBI, J. Edgar Hoover. Have any of you heard of J. Edgar Hoover? Uh, J. Edgar Hoover um, had a naughty side to him, as you may have heard. And my father used, we used to have a, um, what are they called? A Brumus was a Newfoundland. Do you know what a Newfoundland dog is? Very big dog. He would get along well in Texas. Lots of drooling. And whenever, and my father always brought him to the office, and whenever J. Edgar Hoover asked my father to go see him, he'd bring the dog with him. Which, drove J. Edgar Hoover nuts. But at one point, um, my mother thought, we should all go see the FBI director and then go take a tour of the FBI building. And there was a suggestion box. And my mother always had a red pen because she did, did the crossword puzzle in red pen. Pretty good, don't you think? Mm -hmm. No erasures. And she was very good at doing the New York Times crossword puzzle. And she put in her the suggestion box, get a new director. <laughs> you can see why they didn't get along, um, Jared Grover and my father. Anyway, what was good of, okay, I, I told you the funny start of stuff, but it was, there was a very serious side of growing up in my family. Um, I could go on forever. I don't know how long. No, I'd like, like for you to tell them about the hearings you used to attend oh, yes. with your mother. So my mother, um, when I was growing up, um, when I was three and four, five years old, unlike most of you who's probably had a mother who took you to the playground where you could play on the jungle gym, climb on the jungle gym, play on the seesaw, go in the sandbox, my mother took me to the Senate Racket Committee hearings. <laughs> For those of you who don't know, that was the investigation of Jimmy Hoffa. So some of my, who was a, th a thug, and um, so you may, my, some of my first words growing up were, I refuse to answer that question <laughs> on the grounds that it may tend to incriminate me. Because he said it over and over and over again. Um, Did it work at your house? It, <laughs> no. <laughs> so we, you know, my parents believe very much that we should know what was going on in the world, obviously bringing a four-year-old to the Senate Racket Committee hearings. At dinner each night, we... We were quizzed on current events. It was very important to where you sat next to my mother, just read the front page as you went around the table, and there were 11 kids. You really had to know a lot that was going on. We got quizzed on history. Um, after, uh, and uh, uh, my mother thought this was such a good idea. She also quizzed the carpool on history. They say, oh no, Mrs. Kennedy is driving. What happened today? So there was this whole sense. And then every Sunday, we had to recite, learn, memorize a poem or, re or uh, do a history a project on somebody famous in history. Um, so there was a real sense that we needed to know what was going on, and, and my father and mother really wanted us to learn and to understand that we had a responsibility uh, to give something back in our country. I remember, I'll just tell you one more story, and then we can move on to different things. I can talk about my family forever, as you can tell. Um, but I remember once, he, he, when he was a senator, he went to Mississippi, uh, and this was the first time they were having hunger hearings in Mississippi. And he came back to our, our house, and as you can imagine, we lived in a beautiful home with a crystal chandelier and a 
lovely table with a cook who cooked dinner and for us and uh, excellent food. And I was there by myself for some reason, and my father walked in, and he was really shaken. And he said, you know, I've just been to Mississippi, and I've seen a family that lives in a hut, a shack the size of our dining room. And the children have distended stomachs, and there are sores all over them because they don't have enough to eat, and they don't have any health care. Um, do you know how lucky you are, Kathleen? Do you know how lucky you are? got to do something for your country. And that was a message we heard often. Um, we often, heard, you know, we read the Bible every night. Which my, When I told my grandmother we read the Bible, she was horrified. She said, Catholics don't read the Bible. <laughs> <laughs> we'll bring your uncle. Uh, but, go ahead. I'm sorry. <laughs> but we can get into that later if you're interested. In. <laughs> Catholics are now allowed to read the Bible. But um, uh, we often, he would quote St. Luke, from those who have been given much, much will be expected. And there was a real sense that we had been very blessed, our family, and that we really did have a responsibility to give something back. Well, when your uncle, uh, John F. Kennedy, was elected president, and you were about nine years old, how did that impact you and your siblings and your family? Well, it was great. I mean, I thought we were very lucky to have a, an uncle who was president. I mean, who wouldn't be lucky? He, you know, we'd go to the White House. Um, uh, we, you know, we had a front row seat on history. Uh, we were there when the inauguration, when John Kennedy said, ask not what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country. There was a whole sense that there was an excitement about being an American and being a leader, leading nation in the world, and feeling that you can make a difference. Um, we often went to my father's, who was then the attorney general's office, and he would pick, put our pictures, our drawings up on the wall, and he would also uh, talk to us about what was going on. That was the time of the Civil Rights Movement, and it was a very difficult time in our country. And he would explain to us what was happening. Uh, so we were, we were very, I, I mean, what can I say? We were fortunate. When your uncle, President Kennedy, and later your father, Robert, were assassinated, your life must have changed. Tell us a little about how that impacted you and how it affected you. Well, I th thank you. And I, wa I want to say, you heard um, from the introduction that my father um, after, uh, wrote me a letter uh, after my, my uncle died. And he quoted parts of the letter. He's, um, and I have, you have to think about this. My father's best friend, his brother, had been killed. A terrible situation. And it was a moment when he ha was... You know, organizing the funeral, trying to bring many, many heads of state were coming to Washington. He was wondering what would happen to Jack. He was wondering what would happen to him, what his relationship with Lyndon Johnson would be, which, as many of you know, wasn't always that warm and, and good a relationship. And yet, um, he had the presence of mind to sit down uh, on the day of the funeral. He said, Dear Kathleen, you seem to understand that Jack died and was buried today as the oldest of the Kennedy grandchildren, you have a special responsibility, a responsibility to Jack and Joe. Um, be kind to others and work for your country. Love, Daddy. Now you think about it, um, how many people after their brother dies and is killed in such a horrendous circumstances is not filled with feelings of revenge or anger or I need to get that person? but rather writes their daughter, me, a letter that uses the words love and responsibility and working for your country. And I, I think that's really was one of the most important things that he and my mother passed on to us because as you well know, living in Texas, there are many theories about what happened in Dallas and there's a lot of speculation and we could have spent the last 50 years of our lives trying to find out and ferret out what actually happened. But we didn't. What we did instead is say, you can't bring Jack Kennedy back. It's over. And what we have to do is ourselves move forward and see what kind of contribution we could make to our family and to our country. And it meant that all my brothers and sisters and my cousins and other the aunts and uncles did not live 
in the kind of bitterness that really can grip you if you think something unfair and unjust has happened. And as my uncle John said, John Jack Kennedy often said, life is unfair. It is. Some of us are born well off, others aren't. Some are born with a handicap, others aren't. Some of us are born orphans, others aren't. You, each of you in your own families know some of you have been more fortunate than others, and you can be envious and angry, or you can say, what kind of contribution can I make? And I gotta say, I learned this from my family. I could have, they could have taught us something different. And I think I'm very, very blessed by both my mother and my father for making us not angry and bitter and backward looking, but forward looking, which I think is really what America is all about. It's going forward. I think that's what Texas is all about, going forward welcome you in and saying, what more can we do? I agree, and I think that that's very well said. Thank you. <laughs> We're going to move to the next slide in the next question, which is, it's, uh, it's too bad not everybody in this audience has this great memory of the Cuban Missile Crisis, but uh, it was reported that your family chose to stay in Washington, D.C. rather than to seek uh, safer shelter. Right. Tell us about that time, any yeah. memory you might have about the Cuban Missile Crisis. Well, the, I'm, I'm glad you asked about the Cuban Missile Crisis because I think it is, uh, we had the 50th anniversary this October and um, actually I, I, because of some reasons, I was actually reading a lot of my paper, my father's papers at the Kennedy Library that had not been released yet to the public. We eventually did release it right before the Cuban Missile Crisis about what was going on. And I went to South Carolina to see, um, to do a special memorial for Major Anderson, who was the one person who died in the Cuban Missile Crisis. He was the U-2 pilot that was shot down over Cuba um, by the um, SAM missiles uh, uh, by the so uh, that the Soviets had installed in Cuba. And what that crisis, I think, really taught was, it, was it showed us a number of things. First of all, you know, my it was a dangerous, very dangerous time in our in our country's history. And my father asked my mother, would she like to leave and get out of Washington because it would be too, you know, it might be dangerous. And my mother said no; she wanted to stay with my father. And so he asked all of us, what would we like to do? Well, of course, when your mother says she's going to stay with her father, what choice do we have? <laughs> <laughs> so we did. But I have to tell you, you know, even before that time, um, some of you may remember, I mean, if, I'm sorry, you students, you didn't never went through this, but we grew up, my, my age, you know, we grew up with the threat of nuclear war, so we used to have these uh, practices that, you know, the bombs are coming, and we crawl under the desk and put our hands over our head. And there were a number of our neighbors and friends who would build bomb shelters um, and then stack, stack them up with lots of food. And one of my best friend's family did that. And I asked my father, why did, are we going to do that? And he said, no, I, I don't want to be in a situation ever in which I would be telling people, no, you can't get in. I'm going to be safe and you're not going to be safe. He just thought well, that was so morally abhorrent to think that he would try to save himself and not save his neighbors. So we never built a bomb shelter, and obviously we didn't leave Washington. And one of the, so I want to just say it was a long-standing view of his. And what he really, I think the Cuban, and I'm sure you've all studied this and read all those stories about how uh, during the Cuban Missile Crisis, the, the, the story of World War I kept coming to the fore, um, and Barbara Tuckman's, I, I, I love this, you have a terrific history department here. Barbara Tuckman's book, The Guns of August, kept, kept reminding John Kennedy that you can fall into war because you, you don't, you, you're so angry, you want to take revenge right now, and then uh, you don't think what's going to happen the second step or the third step. And he said, what happens to the fourth step? We'll all be annihilated, and who will know what goes on? And there were a number of people, as you know, the military, um, uh, parts of the military wanted to take this as excuse to a uh, bomb uh, and to annihilate uh, Cuba. In fact, General LeMay, Curtis LeMay, who was head of the Air Force, ordered the Air Force planes to fly over the fail-safe 
zone, which was the line that Americans and the Russians or the Soviets had agreed that we wouldn't pass, so we didn't want to threaten each side. And he wanted, he told them to fly over because he wanted to provoke the Russians or the Soviets to getting back to us. And at the end of the Cuban Missile Crisis, um, when my uncle, John Kennedy, had the uh, Joint Chiefs of Staff into the White House to thank them for what they had done during the Cuban Missile Crisis, um, General LeMay said to him, you're a traitor. You should be impeached for not going to war. Anyway, my, thought, my uncle had understood that you can't always trust the military because they wanted to bomb. And they didn't know, and it was really lucky that they didn't bomb because you learned about 20 years later that if they had bombed, they, had they didn't know that there were any Cuban, any missiles in Cuba that were then nuclear tipped. Mm -hmm. And if they, we had started the bomb, the nuclear bombs, uh, missiles would have come right back to the United States and killed millions and millions of people. So they were promising one thing, but they didn't really think about the next step. When my uncle, John Kennedy, said to the generals, what would happen if we bombed Cuba? What do you think the Soviets would do? They said, oh, well, they won't do anything. It's like, have they played war games? Um, obviously, I think our military has learned a lot, and they do uh, sort out war games now, but they hadn't at that point, and it was just phenomenal. I mean, that they hadn't really focused on what would happen. And I don't know if any of you, Evan Thomas in his book about my father thought that really a lot of their understanding of the limitations of the military, which is an important point, came because the week before um, they were trying to uh, integrate the University of Mississippi uh, with James Meredith. And uh, as you, you may, for those of you who are old enough, remember that it was a very dangerous time. Um, and in fact, my father, uh, my, my uncle had to call out the military and deputize them, uh, the National Guard, and deputize them. And they kept promising they would get to the University of Mississippi within an hour. And in fact, it took them eight hours. So they couldn't even, and they were communicating with the, the university, with the military, with coins, like putting coins in the telephone. I mean, that's how bad the communications were. If you couldn't communicate with your own military on American soil, how were you going to do a good job in Cuba? It was also your father who, when uh, President Kennedy was trying to make the decision as whether or not to bomb, it was Robert Kennedy, your father, who stood by his side and said, no, we cannot do this. No, and he had sort of changed. Well, he said we couldn't, be, we couldn't bomb first because that's not American. We couldn't be the aggressors. He said, you know, we're not going to be like Japan and Pearl Harbor. That was, you know, that was such a terrible thing to do. That can't be the American way. Because he understood that, and he said this, what makes America great is not just our military force, but our values. And we have to stay true to our values. I think that's excellent. Much has been reported about uh, Senator Ted Kennedy stepping up uh, to become the surrogate father when uh, both Robert and Jack were killed. And we use those terms by first name, just like I call you Kathleen. But how was that for you 10 siblings and your cousins that you had Ted Kennedy uh, in that? Well, we were very lucky um, to have him there. Um, I'll just tell you a brief story. You know, when I got married in 1973, and I was, you know, in love and very excited about getting married. And um, I learned two nights, two nights before my wedding, I went by my mother's bathroom and I saw her crying. And I said, Mom, what's, what's wrong? And she said, I don't want to tell you. And I said, oh, come on, tell me what's wrong, what's happening? And she said, your cousin, little Teddy, um, he was little at that moment, he was 12 years old, has cancer of the leg, and he has to have his leg amputated. So my, fa my uncle Teddy left the hospital, picked me up at my house, walked me down the aisle, and went back to the hospital to see his son's leg be amputated. So 
you can see. Yeah, I'd say he was very influential in, so he and was, helpful. He was, um, he, you know, he had to take care of a lot of people at once. When did you first know that you wanted a future in government, both as a public servant and as an elected official? Well, thank you for asking. I, um, as you know, I grew up in a political family. <laughs> you got that. You got that. But, you know, when I was growing up, it was the guys who were in politics. My, you know, my uncle John Kennedy was president. My father ran for president. My uncle Sarge Schreiber eventually ran for president. Teddy ran for president. All the guys. Um, now, the women made a real contribution. My Aunt Eunice, as many of you know, started the Special Olympics. And um, I was with, you know, I remember she started in her backyard. And when I was 15, I volunteered in her backyard into what eventually became the Special Olympics, 132 countries. But for me, it was guys who were involved in politics. And so I always gave a lot of credit to the women's movement that opened up my eyes to what I could do. And I tell you this because it's really, a lot of people talk about the importance of family values, and they're clearly important. And I come from a great family with lots of great values. But sometimes families are narrow, and they don't see things that they could see, like the role of women. And it was really the women's movement that opened me up to the, the idea that I could run for political office and that I could have a speaking role, not a behind-the-scenes role. Look, my mother is very strong, and I mean, you know, she's stealing horses, right? Um, and Eunice started the Special Olympics, and my Aunt Jean uh, actually started the Very Special Arts and then was ambassador to Ireland and helped bring peace to Ireland and did... So, in other words, the women had lots of capacity, but they didn't have a culture that was willing to accept them. And that's why I really think it's important to understand the role of culture. Um, and that you first opens ran, up ideas. it was in 80. Yeah, I mean, you first ran uh, for Congress in 1986, and at that point I had uh, three children. And I was asked over and over again, how can you run for office with your three children? Why aren't you staying home and taking care of them? And I would try to say, nobody asked my father how he could run for president with 10 children. <laughs> um, but obviously, there was a different view about women, what women should do and what guys should do. And then, uh, but it's changed quickly. In 1994, I ran for lieutenant governor. I was chosen it was, in, in Maryland. You're ch Unlike, you know, I guess unlike Texas where you have, a, you, you, I guess you run for lieutenant governor separately. In Maryland you run as a team. And, and I was one of, in 1992 there were three women lieutenant governors, female lieutenant governors in the country. By 1994 there were 21. It just switched because of the Anita Hill hearings and people in politics. And that's the great thing about politics. You can go along like this and nothing happened and then suddenly there's a ph phenomena and it changed. And, it, and I was very fortunate to be at the, you've got to be prepared, but you also have to, the, the politics has to be right as well. Everyth politics yeah. and politics, everything's timing. You know, I got to tell a story about getting married, because I told a few people today about, um, about how I got married. I told you about the wedding, but let me tell you another thing. So, because I'm at a college and it might be relevant to some of you students. So I, um, when I was in college, I had a crush on my teacher. Doesn't happen here. If that, I, don't know if, <laughs> I don't know if that ever happens to you, but just in case. So I said to him, um, I think we should meet more often. <laughs> and he said, why? So dense, you know, those professors sometimes don't get it. So um, I said, we well, you know, were reading such great literature. And um, it, that didn't turn him on. So, <laughs> and he was a very straight guy. He didn't think, you know, teachers should have any relationships with their students, which I'm sure is true at SFA. <laughs> and he also had a girlfriend. I love that sympathy. So I had this, you know, like, what was I going to do? I had to get him away from teaching, and so it wouldn't be, you know, unethical. And I had to get him away from his girlfriend, right? 
So, thank you. <laughs> so we were reading American literature, and we re read Mark Twain. So I thought, great idea. Why don't we just build a raft and float down the Mississippi? <laughs> so we, um, I suggested it. Of course, he did get that. And so we went to um, Cape Girardeau, Missouri, and we built a raft, 12 feet by 24 feet, with a little hut on top, because there are a lot of mosquitoes on the Mississippi. And we needed protection. We floated 500 miles down the Mississippi to East Carroll Parish, Louisiana. Mm -hmm. And we just celebrated our 39th wedding anniversary. <laughs> Well, this is a dumb, the, the list of questions. So I, I'm, that's my story about thinking outside the box. <laughs> <laughs> but tell us what your husband does. I thought that we had to talk about that. No, I just thought you, you would enjoy that story. Um, a little humor helps. Um, my husband is a professor, and uh, I hope that none of his students are like me. <laughs> Moving right on. Don't you have some more questions? <laughs> <laughs> well, this was a surprise. I had not heard this story, so I loved it. <laughs> okay. Through your writings and interviews, I see and hear the passion that you want to give back. And not only do you want to give back, you want the rest of us to give back. You help design and implement a, a police corps, yes. as well as a character education. Tell us a little bit about how that developed, because right. it took some years. You're right. So in 19... Um, in 1982, I uh, worked on a program called a police corps, which gives college scholarships to those who promise to be police officers um, for four years, like an ROTC for police. Because I believed that, and I, as you can see, I'm in love with the police. They did get my bag. <laughs> so thank you very much. But they do much many more important things. And one of the things I thought about police work is that it's very important um, not only to be able to shoot a gun well, uh, but really to talk to people, um, because a lot of times uh, crime is, occurs because people don't communicate well. And if you can communicate, if you can understand what people are going through, you can help to reduce the crime. So I thought those are the, the, the skills that are learned in college. And so I started this idea in 1982. And I tell you this because I didn't actually get to implement the idea. I, then I went to work at the Justice Department where I worked to get funding for this idea that 10 years later um, in 1993. And then when I became lieutenant governor, Maryland became the first state in the country, along with um, uh, South Carolina, to implement the Peace Corps, Police Corps. And it was a really great program in which young people did go to college. They came out. They served as Police Corps. And I, I run into them all the time. And sometimes in airports, they eventually be join the FBI or the Secret Service. And it was really a way to say, you know, we want the best and our brightest people to go into police um, work. And I, I really thought that I think that we've done important. that in Nacogdoches. I think we, that's an excellent. I think it's great. And then um, uh, out of that grew my interest in making sure that Maryland became the first state in the country. I worked eight years on this to make sure to get all kids to do community service as a condition of graduation. Because I believed, you know, I grew up in a family that obviously did community service all the time. In fact, you know, there was nothing voluntary about it. <laughs> That's what you did. And so I thought, uh, we learn to do things. As Aristotle said, um, we learn to be, play a harp by playing the harp. We learn to uh, build houses by building houses. We grow to be just by doing things that are just. We don't just do it by being told to do what is right. I mean, if that were did, it would be easy. You know, stop smoking, don't drink so much, don't eat so much. We know what the right thing is, the actions of actually doing it. So I wanted to have a, a habit of service. And so I worked in Maryland to do that as a habit of service. And it was opposed, and I was telling you this, by um, 22 of the 24 boards of education, the teachers union, and the PTA. What do you think of that? <laughs> So it was, a really, it was a really good phenomena for me to actually have to build support among teachers, students, um, the businesses, the voluntary associations. We have about 800 people testify in the hearing um, when it was trying to be overturned. And obviously, I'm only telling you this because I won. <laughs> um, but uh, par par 
part of the reason it was opposed, and there were a lot of reasons opposed, the head of the teachers union said it was a violation of the 13th Amendment, slave labor. Uh, the Wall Street Journal said it was a violation of child labor laws. Weird stuff. It was the only time the Wall Street Journal ever cared about child labor laws. <laughs> um, but uh, out of that came, and a lot of people said, I'm trying to impose values. That was the big argument. You can't impose values. But public schools are not a place to teach values. And I said, no, that's not true. P values are very important, and character education is actually why we have schools. It's not just enough to know reading, writing, and arithmetic. You have to know to be courageous and respectful and kind and civil to others. And so out of that came, when I became lieutenant governor, I started a character education program in the state of Maryland. And I got to tell you, one of the funny stories about this, I went, once went to a school in which it was a very tough part of the, of the state. There were, you know, the, the broken windows on, on the street and, you know, drug needles. But you go into school and it was very peaceful. And there was a real sense of order and, and kindness and civility. And so I said to the fifth graders, this was an elementary school, is it tough to be leaders at a character education school because you have to tell others what to do? And these, these, these little fifth graders said, oh no, we like to be leaders. We have the responsibility to do what is right and we know what to do. Hmm. Okay. <laughs> wow. And, you know, leadership and responsibility, um, I mean, eventually they'll go to middle school and they won't pay attention to that. <laughs> but at least by the time they've had that language within them, responsibility, leadership, respect for others. And so that by the time they reach high school and certainly college, they'll remember what they wanted to be as young. I think we all grow through the period of middle school when we don't really behave all that much, but um, maybe you guys did. <laughs> but uh, at least teaching that language and teaching the, how great it can be to be ethical can be You really weren't wonderful. born knowing that. Uh, I think oh, no, I that believe, came. no, no, I am Catholic. I believe in original sin. Like, and I had four kids, and I really believe in original <laughs> sin. <laughs> Well, what were some of those things that you're talking about? The strategies that Joe and Rose Kennedy had to have instilled in their children. And then certainly your dad did, uh, and your mother had a very strong uh, mother. And they, what were some of those strategies that they used to get you all uh, to committed well, to service? Well, you know, service? some of them you might not like. Um, they were really had high standards. I mean... You know, who else quizzes you at the dinner table? Or when we had, we'd had touch football practice, I would be told, we'd had literally, who, what family has touch football practice on Well, Saturdays? not all of us have 11 children to yeah. play with. <laughs> and, and 11 children. You know, we were, I would be told, if you can touch it, you can catch it. Okay, I know in Texas you probably believe that. <laughs> oh, we think we should. <laughs> The Dallas Cowboys. But I mean, you know, there was, yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, we were, we were, there was very, very high standards. You know, we went to, um, you know, we went obviously to daily mass, but in the summer my grandmother went to mass twice on Sundays and daily mass every day. And my mother thought it was a good idea, so we went to daily mass. So when other kids in the summer were you know, sleeping till 9 or 10 in the morning. She was, had us up at 7 o'clock. We were in the car. We went to church. Uh, we had charts, you know, good, bad, and different. <laughs> Anytime we did something good, we were told, I mean, I, none of you are probably Catholic, so you have no idea what I'm talking about. But, you know, we had something called purgatory. Does that ring a bell? You know, oh, if you're doing good, you'll get a soul out of purgatory into heaven, or you'll get a soul that's way down deep in purgatory up the ladder a little bit. <laughs> or you'll get a gold star in heaven if you're good. I mean, and then we always pray to St. Anthony. For those, again, who don't know what I'm talking about, but St. Anthony finds things. In fact, my mother called our, my brother, my, the fourth child, David Anthony, because he would always find parking spaces for her. <laughs> 
and just the other day, you know, we were in Washington, and she was going to, I mean, she shot up in a store, which I know you know, in Texas called Neiman Marcus. <laughs> and she wanted to park right in front of Neiman Marcus, prayed to St. Anthony, and there was a the parking space. My mother did that. <laughs> <laughs> and she was Baptist. <laughs> I mean, so there was, religion was very much part of it. High standards were part of it. Um, there's, I mean, you probably, you know, maybe you've heard the story Teddy tells in his book. Teddy, Teddy had a kind of rascal part of him, you may have heard. Um, and he kind of liked to, you know, play and do other things. So uh, my, unc my grandfather said to him, Teddy, you have a choice. You can be a playboy, and that's, I'm always going to love you, but I won't have much time for you. Um, I want my children to work and give back and be serious. And so I'll always love you, but if you want to be part, if you want to get my affection and attention, you've got you've to be serious. So has, has this work ethic and commitment to serve translated? Well, I think it's a, a commitment to serve. It's a commitment that you have been blessed. Our family was fortunate, and you have to take that seriously. You're not allowed to be a bum. Or modern day women have a full plate. Yes. They have a husband, child, work full time, and don't have full time help. Uh, what can they learn from you that can help them uh, go forward carrying a load but still serving the poor, standing up for social justice, which I know is your strong commitment, instilling a compelling need to give back in their children, and yet still maintain a strong work ethic? Um, it's hard, and what I and I we talked about this. You can't do everything at once. I mean, when you have three small children, and you, it's really hard to work. I mean, now and then I had four. My, my children are 35, 33, 31, and 20, uh, 30, 28, and 21. Obviously, I did not learn planned parenting <laughs> from my mother. So um, basically, what you have to you have to pace yourself. Some days you can take care of your kids. Other days you're working and taking care of your kids, but you can't do both very well. Other days you're focused on service and you can bring your children, but to do everything at once, especially when your children are young, is just too difficult. And so I always said, you know, and I do say this, that raising a family is juggling and you are, you hope that a ball doesn't fall down, but it does fall down at times. And I have to say, when I was lieutenant governor, I missed a lot of my children's soccer games, which they point out to me. <laughs> and they all say, my, the youngest child, who was really grew up after I was lieutenant governor, I mean, she was 11 when I um, stopped being lieutenant governor, she really saw a lot more of me. I went to many more of her games, I went to many more of her plays. And so you, you give something up. I mean, we. I very love, I'm lucky to have these four gl glorious children, but they didn't get a, st a mother who was always there for them. And, I, and, there, and there's a loss in that. I, I just have to say that. I can't pretend that you can have everything. And but so they also th learned th th from you that public service committee. They certainly did, yes. Um, each of them are involved in some way of public service. But that I also think, and I've said to you, it comes from being a Kennedy. The whole world thinks you're supposed to be something, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, you do. <laughs> and so that really f shapes you. And I, I, it really goes back, I want to just say this in a, in a serious manner again, that what the culture tell, the cultural Im messages are important. So the messages that I learned was that I'm part of a family that serves. You can serve in politics, or you can serve by Special Olympics, or Very Special Arts, or Best Buddies, or the Human Rights Award. Or There are lots of ways you can serve, but you can do it. And I think that what the, that's a great message, and I think it's a message that is true in the United States as well, where we have you know, the Points of Light Foundation, which was really started by George Bush, um, and which is run now by Neil Bush, who's chairman of the board and who I work with believes in volunteerism and service. So I think that you can have a phenomena that goes not just with our family, but with other families as well. Obviously, the Bushes learned that too. I'm trying to be bipartisan. It's so difficult. <laughs> <laughs>
That's okay. We've had a few Republicans on this stage, I too. know. That, that's right. I know. I'm just trying to be nice. <laughs> well, let's talk about current events. You brought that up. Besides the issues of church and state, how do you see America getting beyond the rancor that is so prevalent in both state and national government? Well, um, you know, what can I, we do? What can we do? About religion? Or about, no, about the rancor in the... The rancor. Yes. Well, one of the things I really believe you can do, and I really think I learned this from my father, especially during the Cuban Missile Crisis, which is that you have... I mean, let, let's say we're all... I mean, most Americans, like 85% of Americans, say they believe in God. 50% uh, of Americans say that they go to church every Sunday. Only 25%, in fact, do. So we don't even tell the truth about that. <laughs> but at least we see ourselves as believing in God. And when you believe in God, you believe that we're all the children of God, which means that everybody is created by the Creator. And consequently, we should put our, have the ability to put ourselves in others' shoes and understand where they come from. Um, you know, during the Cuban Missile Crisis, my father and John Kennedy really kept trying to figure out what, what are the pressures on Khrushchev? Probably the same that are on him. There's the right wing who wants to go to war. So figure out where he's coming from. And that can be true with every phenomena. Put yourself in the other person's shoes. It's actually a wonderful act of imagination. And rather than just think they're bad and you're good, what John Kennedy said during the Cuban Missile Crisis is that self-righteousness was the most dangerous of all phenomena because you don't ever open yourself to others. And it's been cool to think that we're good and they're bad. It's much easier to think that way. It's much more difficult to put ourselves in each other's shoes. And I think that's really what we need to do. And that's what I think you learn in a university and, and what SFA tries to do is to, un to teach us that we could be, we could be anybody else. One of the, our country's greatest challenges today is the immigration issue. How to treat those who are here illegally and those who uh, want to come. Do you have any suggestions? <laughs> You know, I, I got to tell you, I don't think it's difficult at all. I mean, people came here because there were jobs here, and they wanted to work, and they wanted to help their families. And we didn't have a system that allowed them to come legally. So, you know, um, we have in the law attract, the t term attractive nuisance. Do you re are any of you lawyers? <laughs> Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, an attractive nuisance means that if you have a swimming pool and the neighborhood kids come in, swim in your pool, and drown, it's your fault because it's an attractive nuisance. You've made them, you've tempted them to come. Um, in, in, in my religion, Catholicism, we're told to avoid uh, the occasions of sin. Do you remember that? Baltimore Catechism number. <laughs> And so the United States tempted all these people to come because they gave them jobs. So, and, they, and we need them. They pay taxes. They obey the law at a much higher rate than Americans because they know if they don't obey the law, they're going to be deported. Um, and they are, are adding to our economy. If There are so many counties that are farm-based, like in Alabama, that are letting crops go to waste because Americans aren't working and the uh, immigrants are working. So we need to have a way for immigrants to, to stay here and to, you know, have amnesty um, and because we tempted them, number one. Number two, um, we, need the high, uh, we need our great immigrants who come with well, ha highly educated. I mean, eight, I think it's eight of the last, of the ten largest corporations in the United States were started by immigrants. Apple started by an immigrant. They've done pretty well for us, right? You like your iPhones. You like your stock, although it's done poorly just recently, but it's done pretty well. Um, uh, you know, uh, Google started by immigrants. So they are, they are really important. And if you're like me, 62, you want a large immigrant population to take care of you. 
because they are going to work, whereas, I, well, I did do well by four children, but most people don't have that many, so who's going to do the work? I can see this is not going over well with this audience. <laughs> <laughs> I can't really see your faces, but I'm reading you. <laughs> But, you know, I, I, I just say, I, I think what makes America special is our immigrants. Um, I, and I'm going to tell you, if we don't do a be good job, the countries that are doing r really well right now, Mexico, huge growth, they're, they're all going home. There's a reverse immigration because that's where the jobs are. And we are going to be yearning that we did not do a better job of making sure that we're open to immigration because that's, what our, is, that's where the new ideas, the new energy comes from and why you see the problems in Europe. Why? Because they are, have much more difficulty with accepting immigrants. They're learning how to do it, but they have much more difficulty. America should rejoice in the fact that we can have so many immigrants. Baltimore, um, a city, by the way, that uh, just won the Super Bowl. <laughs> And I love that your purple is the cover of the color of SFA. I thought it was all for my honor until I realized <laughs> it wasn't. But we have um, the mayor of Baltimore has a special program to attract immigrants because she knows that they're the job creators. How about that? <laughs> well, we have reached close to the end of our hour. Uh, as we, I think we could stay here a while longer. But for your last question, how do you see America's future? And is there anything that else that you would like to share with us? I'm well, going to read something out of your I book. I have to when tell you, through. I am um, I am so bullish and enthusiastic about America's future. I, I really do think um, because we have had this strong immigration, we have a very dynamic workforce. Um, uh, we really do, and. People are, want to work, uh, they want to do well. I think we're very blessed in that. I think that we are also blessed, very frankly, and we, ha we're have about to, we are in the midst, and it's going to keep growing, of an energy boom, um, which is going to make America energy independent, which will do great things. It means we won't have to go to war over oil. It means that we won't have to import a lot of our, our oil. In fact, we can export some of it, and that will be a boon to local governments. It will be a boon to the federal government. It will also be a boon to manufacturing because our energy costs will be one-fifth the amount of energy costs um, in Europe and in other countries. And between, Latin, between Latin, South America and North America, we will have more energy than uh, the Middle East. So we have a great future um, because of our low-cost energy. And out of that, we'll be able to come um, changes, m more money for um, uh, infrastructure, roads. I mean, I've got to tell you, coming out here on that great highway from Houston, I couldn't believe that it was two and a half hours away that I was coming to, but at least it was a great road. <laughs> and you know, this is, this is important. Great roads, great railways, great airports. I mean, you, this is what helps a country do well, and we will do a good job, I believe, in figuring out our medical uh, issues. Um, we spend a, a third of our medical dollars now on obesity. Uh, we're going to get in shape, right? Yeah. We're going to get in shape. We're going to get our brains going. We're going to be the inventors of the world. We're going to be the tough guys of the world. And we are going to continue to be the, the exceptional nation that the rest of the country needs. I travel all around the world. And they, people look to the United States for examples of human rights and civil rights and freedom. And I'll tell you, if we believe in that and work hard and help one another, nothing can stop us. Thank you very much. In your book, you discuss a number of people who have served the world and the country. These are heroes on a superhuman scale. We may not match their efforts, and we may become dis discouraged along the way, just as they did. But these are not reasons for us not to try. And I want to thank you 
personally and collectively for trying so hard to make this a better place for all of us. You're a great example. Thank you.